Yeah, I used to introduce myself as the person whose answering, your answering machine would hang up on. You get an idea, I have kind of a soft voice. Um, anyhow, so I've been involved in the field for, for a while and uh, was actually the uh, director of field studies at UCLA. So I've had experience in higher education and I was the uh, founding director of the National Service Learning Clearinghouse um, in the 1990s, University of Minnesota. I've done a lot of research in service learning and civic engagement. Um, <clears throat> so I've kind of been around in lots of different facets of, of the service learning and civic engagement world. Uh, and as somebody who's uh, in the twilight of his career, um, <clears throat> I don't know how many people here are 65 or older, so if you can all stand, if you can stand at all. Um, <clears throat> so that makes me the only one in the room uh, of <clears throat> our senior citizen generation. But seriously, what I wanted to do is to uh, do a presentation and talk with Kathy about uh, discussing teacher education and also teacher education in a larger context of educational reform. And so what I'm hoping to do is to present a few ideas about what I think has happened in the last 80 years or so related to service learning and to put out some ideas in terms of why the field has either been successful or not quite so successful, depending on your perspective. Uh, I'm hoping to make it interactive so that you'll have about a half an hour to address some issues and talk at your table. And then I'll make a few final comments and we'll have some final discussion to figure out um, what we're supposed to do for the next 30 years. So I know a lot of the sessions are supposed to have goals, so that's really my goal is to have you think about what's happened over the last 80 years and to develop a plan for the next 30. There are a lot of people who think that service learning is a relatively new idea. Uh, I would argue quite the contrary. <clears throat> the term was developed in the 1960s. I'm probably, again, as an older person, I worked with Bob Sigmund <clears throat> and Bill Ramsey, who were the two people who actually coined the term service learning in the late 1960s. Um, and it's been around since then, as we know it as service learning, but uh, I would suggest that the ideas of service learning have been around for a lot longer. And if we look at some of the historical issues <clears throat> that arose in the 1930s, and I'll start with that, uh, I think you'll see that there have been some trends and hopefully we're gonna learn some lessons about what we need to do to be smarter and be more effective in terms of trying to sustain service learning uh, for the next 30 years. How many of you remember hearing about the progressive movement? A few, okay. Uh, the progressive movement in the 1930s, uh, a lot of the people who talk about experiential learning talk about John Dewey. He was part of the progressive movement. Um, and there was an effort in the 1930s to reform education. And I wanted to focus on one key person, Harold Rugg, uh, who was uh, instrumental in developing a lot of things that we would call service learning. As you can see from the uh, PowerPoint, he wrote curriculum for middle schools. He wrote about child-centered schools. And so one of the goals of the progressive movement in the 30 was to create child-centered schools, to have youth voice, to have young people connect with community, and they even used terms, his term social reconstruction, but a lot of people talked about social justice, and exposing young people to the problems of the world so those could be the basis of their education. Rugg was particularly important because, as you'll note, he was the co-founder for the National Council of Social Studies. And so while lots of service learning organizations have developed, the National Council of Social Studies has been around for a long time and ostensibly has been dealing with service learning and civic engagement uh, for the last 80 years. One of the things that we learned about Rugg was as he developed his initiatives, wrote his textbooks, was reforming middle schools, he came under criticism particularly from two major organizations, the National Association of Manufacturers and the American Legion. 
One of the problems that progressives experienced in the 1930s, and we may argue uh, <clears throat> might be similar to some of the issues today, is that he was considered liberal. He was labeled a socialist or communist. And in fact, the National Association of Manufacturers and other uh, business organizations were able to stop the progressive movement. They felt it was unpatriotic to criticize America. It was unpatriotic to question authority. And so uh, they felt that the kind of education that he was proposing <coughs> was un-American. And as you can see, his textbooks were stopped in the 1940s, early 1940s, and the progressive movement ground to a halt. There was another writer in the 1930s who was a contemporary. Both of these guys were contemporaries of Dewey. Uh, John Dewey worked at, at Columbia University and the University of Chicago. Uh, Counts is, is important because uh, he was also the chair of the American Labor Party. And Counts wrote a series of lectures about dare the schools build a new social order. And one of the questions that he was asking, and which we ask today in the service learning movement, is can we make education reform and can it come from schools? Can young people actually do something to eliminate poverty, to eliminate problems of hunger, to help with uh, health care? And so his question was, can we do it? And his argument was, it's a tough job because there are a lot of competing issues. One of the things that we don't hear much about in the service learning movement is that there are people who don't support it, who don't think that exposing young people to the problems <clears throat> of local businesses is a good thing. Because if they find that those local businesses are polluting the streams, uh, then you have some unhappy business owners. So kids ought to be in classrooms. They ought to be studying good American history. And that's the total of their education. And so Counts thought that schools should be driven, as the bottom line says, to transform the rest of society. And he, again, was labeled as a political activist. And uh, the social justice and the kinds of reforms that he was trying to initiate uh, fell out of favor. And so the first lessons that I'm trying to suggest that we need to remember from the 1930s is that there were people who were talking about things like service learning. <clears throat> there were educators all across the country who thought it was good to connect with community and to have student-centered schools, <clears throat> but that there were people who were uh, opposed to it, primarily from the business community and from patriotic groups who thought that it was un-American. And the sum total of what we've learned from the 30s is that when educators confronted people who had influence in business and money and power, that educators tended to lose. So that's our first lesson, is that there is a battle that has been fought around service learning. And in the 1930s, service learning didn't prevail. There was another movement to try to connect young people with community in the 1970s. It was called the Experience-Based Career Education Movement. There are well over a million kids who were part of a, an effort to try to connect with community, to learn about careers, to learn about community problem solving. In fact, there were four uh, educational laboratories uh, <clears throat> that were developing the curriculum and these models of career-based education. Um, and they're listed there, as you can see. So from San Francisco all the way to Appalachia. Um, and they developed extensive curriculum. And one of the powers of this educational reform was that they tried to connect career education with academic content. And so there was, if you know anything about the history of uh, career and technical education, uh, the Smith-Hughes Act in 1917, which was kind of the father parent of vocational education in the United States, talked about separating academics from vocational technical education. So in the 1917, we were talking about separating vocation and community. By the time we reached the 1970s, we were talking about how can we reconfigure that. In fact, my dissertation <clears throat> when I was involved in this movement was the uh, development of a high school for health sciences in Watts in South Central Los Angeles, which was a totally integrated school. 
So the students went to a medical center as part of their regular high school education um, one to two days a week, and they were expected to learn chemistry. So when the kids were in the pulmonary functions lab, they had learning that related to uh, learning about how blood was oxygenated. They had a blood gas analyzer over in the corner, so they were learning about pH. So they were learning basic concepts in all of the academic subjects. Um, there was an entire organization, the National uh, Association for Experience-Based Career Education. Uh, I happened to be the president in 1980 to 82. So there were initiatives to try to connect young people with the community. Uh, there was a lot of research. These four labs were involved in doing research on the topic. Did current kids learn careers? Did kids learn about academic subjects? And did kids learn how to be problem solvers? Because this is really problem-based, project-based education. And there was an organization called the National Diffusion Network. And if you had sound research in programs that were considered to be replicable, then the federal government provided resources to help get those uh, shared across the country. What happened, EBCE was dropped from the National Diffusion Network because they had early research to show that it was effective, but it was not ongoing. And so when they came up for renewal, uh, they didn't have a body of research to suggest that it was effective. Um, it was separated from more traditional work experience and got into this fuzzy area that you could actually learn academic subjects in community contexts. The work experience people were saying, no, uh, work experience career education was about learning about a job, learning how to do a trade. And here you had these career educators who were saying, no, it's learning about how to choose an occupation. And so there was this conflict between the people who thought that you should learn skills and the people who thought you should learn kind of generic academic subjects. One of the major studies that was done at the Northwest Lab suggested that one of the reasons it failed was because the EBC program never got into schools of education. It was not being promoted <clears throat> actively in colleges and of teacher education, partly because most of the faculty had never participated in these programs. And so we have a dilemma, and some would suggest the same dilemma today, and that is a lot of the faculty who are teaching our teachers have never experienced the kinds of programs that connect with community for academic purposes. There was also something else that happened in the 80s, a nation at risk. The nation at risk talked about how we were falling behind the rest of the world, and we needed to redouble our academic intensity. And so there were a whole host of organizations that were experiential learning organizations uh, <clears throat> that wrote a response to a nation at risk. Jim Kilsmeyer was president of the Association for Experiential Education at that time. He and a couple of other organizations wrote a response. Uh, but as you can tell, uh, the nation at risk prevailed, and we started to refocus on academic classroom-based learning. So what was the lesson from the EBCE reform? <clears throat> um, sometimes we get derailed by a crisis in education. Nation at risk came along to undermine the experiential learning movement of the 70s. Um, <clears throat> and we have people both in uh, policy-making arenas and educators who think that we have to, again, to refocus on classroom-based instruction. We also had a need for this evidence-based practice, and so the fact that there had been early research on EBCE but not later uh, suggested that it's important for reform to maintain a research evidence base in order to continue to show that, in fact, it has efficacy and effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> And then the third one, certainly about, there's a role about teacher education. If you want to develop a sustainable education reform, you need to include colleges of education, and they need to make the point that whatever it is that you're trying to do is important enough so that new teachers learn about it and learn how to practice it and learn how to implement it. And that didn't happen with the EBCE movement. Um, the other piece, which is part of the criticism I'll get into, is that whatever you're doing needs to show that kids are learning. And most people's definition of learning is it has something to do with academic content. And so if you expect young people to learn Avogadro's number, or you expect them to learn the, the, the table of elements, or you expect them to learn about how DNA functions, then whatever you do needs to be able to demonstrate that that kind of learning is taking place. And that was difficult to do in an experiential program. 
I want to jump to a couple of theories of educational reform. Um, Seymour Saracen, I don't know if any of you have seen this book, 1990, called The Predictable Failure of Educational Reform. Saracen was a psychologist. He'd studied a lot about teacher education and about American education. And he was suggesting that every time you hear one of these fads about trying to change education, uh, it's doomed to fail. And it's doomed to fail because we don't pay attention to some of the things that we need to do in order to sustain any kind of reform effort. And like you can see, um, he talks about confronting social, institutional, and organizational obstacles. Oops, yes, thanks. Sorry. I could hear me, but I guess you couldn't. Um, and he also suggested that the aim of school was misunderstood. Um, in the current climate, we know that the aim of education is to pass the standardized test. Uh, he was suggesting that even with the nation at risk, that we needed to uh, have academic content learning as the premier outcome of education. And he was suggesting that what we really needed to do was to develop lifelong learners. We needed to encourage young people to get excited about learning, to learn the learning process, and to continue that process as a citizen who can solve problems. He also suggested um, where are we? that young people had to learn, as the slide suggests, about self, about others, about their role in a social environment. And so it wasn't just the kind of content that you find in disciplines, but in fact, it was about living in the real world. And this is much of what John Dewey wrote about uh, in his own work. Um, he had a special concern for teachers and teacher education and suggested that one of the purposes of education was not only for the betterment of young people, which is what people think schools are all about, but in fact, it's about the development of teachers. Teachers grow as a profession. So anybody who thinks that schools are places just for kids doesn't understand the totality of what it means to be a developing teacher. And so he suggested that we needed to develop educational reforms that address those issues. He focused a lot of his book and a lot of his issue on power sharing. And he was suggesting that one of the reasons that education reforms fail is because there isn't equal power sharing among and between groups. And he was specifically talking about teachers and teacher organizations. And he suggested that reforms would not be sustainable until teachers became active partners in the decision-making process. And we can talk a little bit about whether or not that exists today. But that was clearly one of his concerns. Um, <clears throat> he also talked about something heretical in that day, not to us, but that young people need to be part of that power sharing initiative. So when we talk about youth voice in the service learning field, uh, he was talking about that was a main component of effective and sustainable educational reform. For after all, young people live in those schools. And if we're going to teach them anything about democracy and lifelong process, then they had to be part of the decision making and power sharing process. Um, he was also concerned about the use of test scores, and this was early in, uh, in 1990, in the 80s, where people were starting to talk about the importance of measuring uh, learning outcomes by tests. And um, there have been a lot that has been written about standardized tests, and in fact, uh, <clears throat> several have suggested that standardized tests have nothing to do with improving instruction. Standardized tests are all about separating people at different levels in terms of their ability to, to master certain kinds of content. And that's a whole different purpose than trying to develop a testing system that informs teachers about how to provide instruction to students. And so he said we ultimately had to engage all of these groups in power sharing, and especially young people and teachers. Another person who has been involved in the ed reform literature is Tim Mazzoni. Mazzoni died just a few years ago. He was a, a researcher at the University of Minnesota 
and he studied ed reform for over 20 years. And he was interested in the process of who were the players in the education reform initiatives and how did they interact with one another. And he examines, as I show in the slide, the role of government, the role of business, of educational groups. So hopefully you're starting to see some trends in these historical issues that there are groups and players who are beginning to have power over whether or not reforms are sustained or whether or not they're eliminated. And he used um, Iacone's uh, typologies, and Iacone basically talked about uh, four typologies. It's not critical that you know them right now, but basically there were locally based reforms, and he was talking about just at a, at a state level, things that happened in districts, so districts could to make some changes to actually moving to things that were statewide that involved the legislature. And so he looked at this kind of spectrum of who were the players in developing educational reform. Um, and you have on your handout, the first sheet gives you just an inkling of what Mazzoni was looking at in his 20 areas. And I, I, I've run it. That the, there were these arenas of, of power in the ed reform world. And that anybody who's studying and wishing to understand education reform needs to be aware of these arenas. Uh, the subsystems, the members of the legislature, um, some of the agencies and interest groups, so that there uh, are people involved in the service learning world, there are people involved in national uh, career and technical education associations, social studies, all of the disciplines. So these are all players in the ed reform movement. And what he was basically suggesting is until people become aware of the influence of these organizations and how to manipulate their power, um, you're likely not to be on the winning end of an ed reform initiative. Uh, and so part of the goal, you're starting to hear the Saracen thing about power sharing. So you're trying to get power sharing among and between these various organizations. So if the governor of your state doesn't want you to do service learning, it may be very difficult. If in Minnesota, the governor of the state, Rudy Perpich, wanted to have service learning in Minnesota in the 1980s, you had a very strong uh, impetus to do service learning. And a lot of things that happened in Minnesota happened because the governor was pushing the issue. So all I'm trying to do is to call your attention to the fact that we've seen historically that businesses have had interest, that governors have had interest. And then in fact, he talks about four of the major groups, the macros, the media, parents, professional organizations. So if you want to have sustainable reform, they all need to be involved. And so, as he suggests in the final slide, <clears throat> some groups have more influence over uh, certain issues uh, than others. For example, community-based organizations may be very strong supporters of, of service learning, but you may find that the business community is not because service learning students, as I've suggested, may expose problems that the business community doesn't want you to know about. For example, a uh, health initiative. Um, we might want to stop kids from drinking Cokes <clears throat> and eating McDonald's, right? Well, you might hear from Coca-Cola and the McDonald's Corporation that maybe that's not such a good idea. Certainly the mayor, Bloomberg, in New York is, is fighting a battle when he's trying to limit sugary drinks to 16 ounces. So the interest of social justice and people who are concerned with issues like service learning uh, may run into battles with other interest groups. And all I'm trying to do is to call your attention to the fact that if you're going to be effective in doing educational reform, you need to be aware of the interest groups that are for you and the interest groups that are against you so that you can begin to mobilize a strategy so that you can gather the support of the people who are going to help you, and you can outsmart the people who are against you. A little bit just on teacher education reform. Um, I actually did a study in the 1990s of teacher education and talked to people in the community and talked to uh, people who were doing teacher education and came up with kind of two perspectives. People in the, in the community 
who were working as community recipients thought that you learn service learning by doing it. What a strange concept. And faculty in colleges of education thought you learned about service learning by inserting it into a philosophy of education class, a methods class. So you had a little bit here and there, and that would be enough to get you started on service learning. Uh, we also found from the community that they wanted to have more power sharing with universities, that they had something to contribute. And one of the problems that we've had with national conferences and many of the conferences is that we don't have participation by the community. And for most of you who are doing service learning and other community-connected programs, they're pretty important players. And so you would think that they should be part of the process. Um, <clears throat> again, teacher education faculty thought that most of the instruction should occur in classes. Most of the people who were aware of it in the community thought that it had to be learned out in the field. And one of the quotes, and we had a little conversation in this morning's session uh, when Joe Erickson was talking about the problem that many faculty have not experienced uh, teacher education or have not experienced service learning programs. Um, Mary Kennedy, who was a famous researcher at Michigan State in the 80s and 90s, had this particular quote where she said, despite our best intentions, teachers teach as they were taught. And so if that's the case, then we need to find ways to bring teachers into teacher education who have been taught through service learning and community-based methods. The last recommendation that I had made was that if you're going to learn about service learning, you have to do it. It's a pretty simple idea. And so instead of starting teacher education programs with courses, we actually could start teacher educators by doing a service learning project in the community as the first course in their exposure. Jeffrey Anderson and Terry Pickerel have been involved for a long time in teacher education and have written a lot about strategies for uh, improving and including teacher education in our programs and uh, have identified some of the critical challenges and critical issues. Um, and they're listed here and actually on, I'll get to the worksheet in just, in just a second. But I think the number one thing in the research that I had done has been reinforcing the fact that teachers just don't have the time. If you're teaching in a classroom, it's one thing. If you're expected to coordinate with the community, that's a whole different ballgame. And if you don't provide opportunities for teachers to do that, then they're limited in terms of the kinds of service learning that they can, they can do, the kind of engagement where kids really get excited about things and get out into their community. Um, those are limitations. Um, <clears throat> There was also the fact that many of the service learning sites in the community are not well developed. And what I learned from doing this work for, for 30 years was that we have not done a good job of teaching the community members what it means to be a partner in an academic program. Most of them know what it means to receive a volunteer and have a volunteer in their organization. They don't know what it means to have a volunteer serve in our organization and be expected to learn something about math or language arts, or social studies. And so there was a disconnect between community organizations. Also, the fact that if it was learned experientially, uh, old people like me never had a course in teacher education on service learning, and yet we seem to, to learn it pretty well. We learned it by doing it and being around other people who were of like minds. But there are some people who think that, as a second one suggests, uh, it's too complicated for pre-service teachers. Give them a chance just to learn classroom management and learn how to teach a couple of lessons. And then you can do service learning maybe in their second or third or fourth year. Um, <clears throat> and also, the curriculum was so crowded that here's another reform that we need to, to look at. And what I suggested here are these three areas. If you look at your handout, and since some of you don't have it, I won't belabor the point. Uh, again, I can make this article available on the website so that you can find it. But basically, they dealt with the lack of time issue, and they suggested that teachers needed to learn how to begin to develop strategies so that they could arrange for more time in the classroom, arrange for more time to be involved with connecting with community, getting campus-wide service learning centers. So teacher education shouldn't be isolated. It should be part of 
the entire undergraduate and graduate experience. So when I was the director of field studies at UCLA, we literally had hundreds of courses that were involved with connection with the community. And so it was very possible for pre-service teachers to work with others in undergraduate courses where they were doing service learning, um, but they just weren't doing it in a formal teacher education program. His second one, lack of time to pre-service uh, education curriculum. It's one thing to expose pre-service teachers to getting kids out into the community to do some kind of a service project. It's another thing to begin to do the tedious task, which was done in the EBCE movement, and that was to understand how you create curriculum. I teach courses on constructivist curriculum. So there's a whole body of research and theories of learning that say that you construct meaning from your experiences. And so if I want you to understand what it means to, uh, to address a problem of obesity in our country, then it's one thing to talk about it in a class or to give you a few examples. It's another thing for you to begin to get engaged in addressing the issues of obesity. And until you get that engagement, you don't have the understanding. And for most teachers, pre-service teachers, they want something that's canned. Give me the lesson plans and I can implement it. Don't ask me to construct something out of nothing. And so if, if you haven't had that framework, it's a difficult task in the process. I think that maybe I'll just skip ahead because I want to be uh, aware of the time. But so there were some challenges for pre-service teachers. And you're trying to engage them in a process that's far more complicated than implementing a lesson to a group of 30 kids in a classroom. And so that's why it's been a problem in teacher education programs, certainly for the last 20 years. And uh, we can talk more about that in just a bit. <clears throat> My last piece I want you to be aware of is the fact that Don Hill, who was at Stanford and was involved with, with Kathy and the teacher education uh, service learning movement, <clears throat> had written something suggesting that service learning would die by, 19, by 2010, called the death of a dream. And here he has 10 reasons why service learning didn't survive. And again, being a reading teacher, I'm, I'm not going to go over all of these, but I can certainly highlight some. And one of them is the second area, which is service learning is fuzzy. I don't know about you, I'm kind of a slow learner, but I worked with the National Society for Internships and Experiential Education in the 80s, and we developed a lot of the early literature on service learning. And one of the books talks about the fact that there are about 147 definitions of service learning. All I can tell you is it has something to do with service and it has something to do with learning. And somehow they're connected. But what a good exemplar is for service learning is another story altogether. In a previous session, you may have heard about the NYLC 8 uh, standards uh, for effective practice. Well, in the 1990s, we had the uh, Association for Service Learning and Education Reform, the essential elements. Um, they're very similar to the eight standards. And one of the questions that came up in this morning session and came up every time is, do you have to do all of them? So there are issues of diversity. There are issues about student voice. Well, I've seen some really terrific service learning programs where students followed the excitement of a teacher and developed a great service learning program. I just uh, heard a presentation by Tuskegee Airmen. There was a wonderful service learning program in Dubuque, Iowa at an alternative school where the teacher was excited about the Tuskegee Airmen. This was a group of African-American airmen uh, in World War II. Uh, and they got so excited, they did a whole history. They wrote a book. They interviewed airmen, and they actually had airmen come to their graduation ceremony. It was a terrific uh, service learning experience. You would meet most of the requirements, but it didn't have student voice. It did a little bit in terms of a few of the things. So the question is, do we know what the standards are, and are there strong standards? Um, <clears throat> I would argue that there's nothing in education uh, that has strong standards. Uh, as a reading teacher and somebody who's been involved in the issues of reading, uh, the debates about phonics and whole word reading uh, still persist. Um, and usually the answer is yes, we need both. Um, and so it is with service learning. Um, <clears throat> 
But because we couldn't package it in a way that was a nifty uh, curriculum guide, uh, teachers have been reluctant to use it. Uh, individual stories, it's not been something that we could say every service learning program across the country uh, is effective and produces academic outcomes. In fact, we have a body of literature. I know Shelley is presenting right now, but we have some literature that suggests that people who have been in service learning programs don't have academic achievements. They don't have reflective practice. And so the quality of the implementation is something that we need to talk about. Um, service learning grew too quickly. So there was a concern that, in some of the other things that Hill talks about, is that we had foundations that supported service learning and we had the corporation that supported it, but they were supporting it by spreading it widely. So when we hear Wendy talk about the many millions of people who are involved in volunteer work and when I was running the clearinghouse and we talk about evaluating this stuff, we talk about service hours and all of these kinds of things, uh, we don't talk as much about the deep quality of learning that's taking place. And because it's more complicated, again, uh, people just kind of push it aside and say, well, I'll get to that later. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about um, the political implications. And in this way, I think you could refer back to the 1930s. I've done studies of AmeriCorps. I've done studies of VISTA. And the VISTA program became very political in the 70s when VISTA workers started to mobilize poor people to take responsibility for addressing some of the issues in their community. Well, from the political standpoint, that was a no-no. It produced people who were voting the wrong way. And we have AmeriCorps programs that now uh, don't allow you to participate in any kind of political activity. So, so there's a political agenda in when you get into terms like social justice that starts to divide people along political uh, areas. I'm not going to get into which side is which, you probably know, but um, that's an issue if you're trying to push for a national initiative. Um, <clears throat> and the last one about the corporation built its political agenda on AmeriCorps. Um, I'm not here to knock the corporation, wonderful organization, but they do spend most of their money on adult programs. Uh, Learn and Serve was a great program, affected millions of, of young people, um, but only received about 5% of the budget. And so as with most education reform initiatives, um, things happen more in higher education than happen in K-12. Uh, they have more political force. And lastly, um, we didn't have the resources to do the teacher development, to implement it effectively. Um, and the issue on academic achievement here, we've had the No Child Left Behind reform initiative. And um, so there's a lot of strategy, even workshops here on connecting with the common core. And so still this struggle between what is service and what is learning. And there's a confusion around volunteerism. People understand that service is somehow connected to volunteerism. What they don't understand is that it's also a way of learning all of our academic areas. Um, I'm not going to go into the last couple. I think we'll get a chance to talk about them in our smaller groups. Um, there were a few people who made comments. Larry Cuban, who is one of the most notable uh, educational historians at Stanford, talked about the fact that service learning was dead on arrival uh, because we didn't have the policymakers understand and support it. Uh, Louise uh, Giuliano, who had worked in the movement, talked about the fact that it wasn't led by educators, that there were a lot of politicians who were pushing the service initiative, uh, but they didn't understand what the learning was all about. And then uh, this uh, guy we've never heard of, uh, Mr. Kilsmeyer, who suggested that uh, there was a tendency to look at the numbers and not look at the deep learning, and especially, as he suggested, the capacity building of teacher education. But these are some quick ideas from my 80 years of looking at uh, <laughs> is that what's happening internationally is we need to change the focus and the term to civic engagement and not service learning. To me, it doesn't matter what you call it as long as it has the essential elements. Civic engagement and engagement is a much more inclusive term. And so a lot of the partisan issues, most people in democracy don't argue about the fact that people ought to be citizens and that they should learn civic engagement. Um, 
And we want to arm citizens with the knowledge and skills in order to work in a democratic process. Um, and that they need to become informed voters and they need to become informed members of society. And we all have jobs, and the jobs include being a member of a family, a community, a working member of society, having a job, paying taxes, being an active citizen and a lifelong learner, if we go back to what Saracen talked about. So we need to emphasize the lifelong learning process of community engagement. Learning from Mazzoni, we need to get our service learning programs connected to legislators. Legislators are supposed to be community problem solvers. And so if you don't have a program that's somehow connected with local, state, federal legislators, then figure out a way to begin to engage your students to do that. It's easier for them to understand service learning if they have an intern working in their office that's doing the work. Um, <clears throat> begin teacher education at an early age. I'm not facetious when I say start in middle school. We have a program at the University of Minnesota it's called Direct Track where juniors and seniors have a head start on getting into the teacher education program if they've worked in schools. So why not ask students to come to our teacher ed programs and demonstrate the fact that they did service learning in middle school, that they did it in high school, that they did it in college, so that service learning is too complicated to learn in a semester or a year. And so we can begin, and obviously the connection, if you're going to do that, is connect our higher ed institutions to begin to work with the K-12 systems to help them do it. Okay? Focus on local levels, develop high quality practice in schools. We need to have districts that can show that they've implemented high quality service learning and in fact they have outcomes uh, to support it. Mobilize the community, coalesce around some common elements, and I would suggest <clears throat> project-based learning, character development, social emotional development, a whole child initiatives, career preparation are more generic. They all are inclusive of elements of service learning. My studies and many studies of AmeriCorps, for example, show that the top outcome of AmeriCorps members is career and technical knowledge. So when somebody volunteers to work in a school, they learn something about being a teacher. They learn something about uh, the educational process. We also need, and I take this with a grain of salt, we don't need more national conferences. We need more regional conferences. <clears throat> it's nice that you all came to a national conference. It's very expensive and very exclusive. Most of the people who are doing this work are out there in the field every day. Teachers can't get out of classrooms. You have to pay a sub to get them out. Higher ed people sometimes don't understand that. We need to involve community members more. You can't involve community members more unless you're doing work in the community. And so I was suggesting that this conference and many others go on another year, every other year basis. Let's have a national conference one year and let's have a series of regional conferences so many, many more people can attend and we can begin to develop strategies that are active. Um, last, or, or one of the last, work with all of these letters. Association of uh, College of Teacher Education, Association for Career uh, <coughs> uh, Supervision and Curriculum Development, largest educational organization in the 1990s. We had a whole service learning group of 200 people that were part of ASCD and we were presenting. The same with the National Council of Social Studies. I'm involved in the uh, Association of Career and Technical Education. They've had journal after journal that talks about service learning. So I'm just saying there are lots of like-minded people that are doing this. We need to, in some ways, get out of our capsule of only talking to other service learning people and start talking to people who are doing education the way we'd like to do it. We need more learning laboratories. We need high quality models so that our student teachers can see what it looks like and in some ways reverse the process and have the students who have been doing service learning for several years help to teach our new teachers how it's done. Connecting with higher education, as I suggest. Um, and get the students involved, as I suggested, with legislators. And then the last one is we're different than every other reform initiative because they have one element they don't have. We have the students. And so I overheard your suggestion when people say, well, what are you doing? The students do everything. That's the right way to do it. Let the students do everything. You have a, somebody raised the issue about legal restraints. Well, there ought to be students in some class that can study the legal restraints. Some industries like physical therapy, you can't touch somebody unless you have a credential. Uh, there are women's shelters that don't want their addresses out 
so they aren't available to participate. Get students involved in the process of solving all of your problems, because then they have a better understanding of what this is all about. And then the last thing is about uh, have the students be the change they wish to see. I remember some famous person said that, right? Um, and that in all seriousness, we believe in service learning because it really is the essential pedagogy for citizenship in any culture that believes that somebody is supposed to be active, participate. You can't make a decision about global warming. You can't make a decision <clears throat> about whether life begins uh, you know, at conception, unless you have biological knowledge, unless you have environmental knowledge. And so I'm suggesting that by engaging young people in the process, we can bring the academics along with it and hopefully get buy-in from a lot more of the people who would be our opponents.